the course of this presentation, we'll cover periodic engine and chassis maintenance, engine removal, engine overhaul, and component reconditioning, and engine assembly. We'll also cover carburetor service, electrical systems operation and troubleshooting, and we'll finish up with fork rebuilding. Next, we'll cover cylinder reconditioning and the proper procedures for fitting pistons and rings. Boring a cylinder and replacing a piston should only be necessary as a result of two conditions, wear or damage. With regular oil and filter changes and under normal use, this engine's service life can exceed 100,000 miles, so chances are it'll be some time before you see one that's worn out. Damage to the pistons and cylinder walls, though, can occur through neglect, misuse, or improper maintenance. And if you find this type of damage, it's important that you are able to identify and correct the cause before the engine goes back into service. We've got here a few examples of the type of piston damage you may encounter in a four-stroke engine. You'll notice the crown and ringland areas of this piston appear. All the damage has occurred below the wrist pin and is most severe in the center area of the skirt. This sort of damage is a result of overheating caused by either a lack of lubrication, loss of coolant, or insufficient skirt to cylinder wall clearance. Ignition timing and mixture strength are not responsible for this type of damage. Here's a good example of damage that is related to a combustion problem. Although the damage does extend to the skirt, it's easy to see the problem originated above the pin area. The edge of the piston crown is eroded, and at one point, detonation was severe enough to crack and collapse the crown. Often with a piston that's this severely damaged, it's difficult to pinpoint the exact cause. But in this case, because detonation did occur, and it's obvious that the crown was subjected to extreme temperatures, it's safe to assume that the fuel was being ignited too early. The cause was either pre-ignition as a result of a hot spot in the combustion chamber or excessive ignition advance. If the erosion were concentrated toward the exhaust side of the piston, we could assume that either the mixture was too lean or the ignition spark was occurring too late. In either case, the fuel-air mixture would still be burning when the exhaust valve opened. The exhaust valve would likely be burnt, and chances are some exhaust pipe discoloration would be evident. One last example is this XS650 piston. As you can see, it doesn't look too bad, except for these peculiar marks on the crown. What's happened here is the piston was on its way up to top dead center and a valve happened to get in the way. A mechanical failure somewhere in the valve train could be responsible, but the most common cause of this type of damage is simple over-revving. These are only a few examples of the type of piston damage you may encounter. The most important point to remember is that the causes relating to piston damage below the pin are quite different from those that cause damage to the crown area. Now on with cylinder reconditioning. Ideally, a cylinder should be perfectly round and the bore size should be constant from one end to the other. Normal use can, after several thousands of miles, cause the bore to wear out of round and or become oversized in the middle at one end or both. Using a bore gauge, measure the cylinder at the top, the middle, and the bottom. Measurements should be taken at two angles parallel to the center line of the crankshaft and 90 degrees from it. Maximum allowable out of round is 0 0.01 millimeters or 0 0.00039 inches. Taper should not exceed 0 0.05 millimeters or two thousandths. In order to determine the actual skirt to cylinder wall clearance, the piston is measured at a point approximately six and a half millimeters up from the bottom of the skirt. This figure is then subtracted from the bore measurement. Specification here is 0.055 to 0.075 millimeters, or 0.002 to 0.003 inches. If you find that one or more cylinders requires a specific oversize, all four cylinders must be done. An oversized piston fitted to only one cylinder 
will create an imbalance, not so much in terms of weight, but rather in terms of volume. Replace all four pistons with the largest required size. For this engine, oversized pistons and rings are available only in first and second oversizes, 0.25 millimeters and 0.0 millimeters respectively. If you're reinstalling the original pistons, the ring land should be cleaned before new rings are fitted. Before installing the rings, they must be checked for proper end gap. Push the ring down about 20 millimeters into the bore and compare the available gap to the spec in your service manual. If the gap is under the specified minimum, the ring must be carefully filed to increase the measurement to within the specified tolerance. Keep in mind that the spec for the compression rings and the oil control rings is different. Once the rings are in place, clearance between the ring and the ring land should also be verified. Again, the spec is listed in your service manual, and here there is a difference between the first and second compression ring spec. Remember, the ring markings face toward the top of the piston. The next item on our agenda is the oil pump. Again, if you're rebuilding an engine, it's an absolute must that the oil pump be cleaned and inspected. After removing the gear cover and gear, remove the four screws and separate the case halves. Remove the rotors and inspect both the rotor surfaces and the case itself for scratches or other types of damage. If damage is evident, replace the necessary components. Regardless of whether you're reusing the original pieces or replacing them, the clearance between the outer rotor and the case must be checked. The specified range is 0.03 to 0.08 millimeters. Clearance between the inner and outer rotors can range from 0 to a maximum of 0.12 millimeters. Finally, using a straight edge laid across the housing, Check the available clearance between the side face of the rotor and the case. Spec here is 0.03 to 0.08 millimeters. As you can see, checking the oil pump isn't a very complicated operation, and it doesn't take a lot of time. It's very important, though, so don't overlook it. Next, we'll have a look at the water pump. As a rule, if you encounter a problem with this unit, it will more often than not be related to the impeller shaft bearing or the mechanical seal. To avoid having coolant enter the crankcase should the seal fail, the factory has supplied a passage leading from the back of the seal to atmosphere. If coolant leaks from this hole, the mechanical seal needs attention. Begin disassembly by removing the circlip, driven gear, and drive pin. After removal of the impeller shaft circlip, the impeller assembly can be pulled from the housing. The impeller shaft bearing, oil seal, and mechanical seal are located in the housing. The mechanical seal seat is fitted to the impeller. Working from the impeller side of the case, remove the impeller shaft bearing and the seal. Then, working from the bearing side, press the mechanical seal out. The mechanical seal seat can simply be pried from the impeller using a small screwdriver. Any water pump reconditioning process should include the replacement of the mechanical seal seat, the mechanical seal assembly, the oil seal, and any bearings that show signs of wear. The impeller blades should also be checked for cracks or other damage, and the unit replaced if necessary. A light coating of coolant applied to the outer surfaces of the mechanical seal seat will allow it to slide into place easily. Never use oil or grease as a lubricant in this area or on the face of the seat. Before installing the mechanical seal, apply a light coating of Yamabon 4 to the case. Using the seal installing tool, 
press the seal just far enough into the case so that it's seated properly. Any additional pressure could damage the housing. This seal installing tool is the same one used for the vision. Now, while you've got the engine apart, you should take to inspect the transmission pieces. Even if your customer hasn't voiced any concern about shifting or clutch operation, you should make at least a visual inspection of the shafts and gears. Pay particular attention to the engagement dogs. Check for rounding of the dogs in this area and note the amount of engagement by the marks on the side of the dog. If the dogs are worn or damaged, chances are the mating gear will also be damaged in the area of the engagement slots. More often than not, if the gear is worn or damaged, both it and its mating gear will need to be replaced. If extensive gear damage was evident, then it's possible that one or both of the transmission shafts may also be damaged. Visually inspect them and be sure they're straight. Mounted on the end of the counter shaft is the middle drive pinion gear and the drive damper. In order to properly inspect these components, this unit has to be disassembled using this special tool. Place the shaft assembly in a hydraulic press and position the special tool as shown. Compress the damper and remove the two-piece retainer. Place the drive pinion gear in a soft jaw vise and using a 55 millimeter socket, remove the retainer nut. Using a bearing puller, remove the bearing and then the shim. Inspect the damper spring for fatigue or damage and check the damper cams for flat spots or excessive wear. If the pinion gear itself is damaged, you'll replace it, of course. But when you do that, you'll also have to replace the shim. Before we show you how to select the proper size, you should understand why this shimming is necessary. What we're doing here is adjusting the position of the drive gear in relation to the center line of the output shaft. Proper positioning of this gear will ensure that the teeth of both it and the driven gear mesh properly. Now, the formula for shim thickness works like this. Dimension A equals 54.5 millimeters, plus or minus the number stamped on the drive gear. In this case, it happens to be plus 03. If it were a minus figure, the minus sign would appear before the number. So we now have a total figure for dimension A of 54.5 plus 0 0.03 equals 54.53. Now, dimension B is equal to 53 millimeters, plus or minus the number shown here on the upper crankcase. In this case, 95 or 0.95 millimeters. The total figure for dimension B is 53 plus 0.95 equals 53.95. The formula is simply A minus B equals T, or shim thickness. In this case, 54.53 minus 53.95 equals 0.58 millimeters. Since these shims are only available in 0.05 millimeter increments, you'll have to round the number to the nearest available size. In this case, you'd need 0.6 millimeter. You could use two 0.3 millimeter shims to equal 0.6 millimeter, or for that matter, any combination of sizes, provided they total 0.6 millimeters. Your service manual lists the appropriate rounded value for each hundredth millimeter measurement and lists the available shim sizes. Once the appropriate shim size is chosen, reassemble the unit again using the compression tool. And there you have it. Simple enough. Well, it really is quite simple. But rather than trying to remember all that, why don't you just review this portion of the program next time you have to shim a middle gear drive? Okay, let's finish up our transmission inspection. Clean and inspect each bearing. If even slightly worn or rough in rotation, they should be replaced. The shift fork should be checked for wear in the area of gear contact. Uneven wear here often indicates a bent fork 
or excessive play between the fork and fork shaft. Pay close attention to the shift drum engagement pins and the channels of the drum. Even a minor amount of wear or a burr can adversely affect shifting. Finally, inspect the shifter linkage and replace rather than wear any worn or bent components. Various clutch components should also be checked. Check the clutch basket and the clutch hub splines for wear or grooving. The clutch plates and discs should be measured for thickness and any that are worn beyond the specified service limit should be replaced. Now, we haven't covered every possible inspection of every engine component. That would simply take too much time. Common sense, though, should tell you that any component that looks in less than perfect condition should be inspected carefully, and the reason for that part being damaged should be found. Your service manual covers several component checks that we haven't touched on. This program is not intended to replace the service manual, but rather to be used with it, so use both to your best advantage. Okay, now let's see how we go about sizing the crankshaft plane bearings. Selecting the proper crank and rod bearings for this engine is performed using the usual Yamaha method. The crankcase main journal number is subtracted from the indicated crankcase size number. In this case, the number one main bore is numbered five and the number one main journal is number two. The appropriate bearing size is three. Referring to the bearing selection chart in the manual, we see that a number three bearing will be color-coded brown. After determining the appropriate bearing number for each main, fit them into the cases and apply a very light coat of oil to each bearing face. Carefully fit the crankshaft into place and rock it back and forth to displace any excess oil. Simply choosing and installing the correct bearing according to the case and crankshaft numbers is not sufficient. Oil clearance must be verified using the plastic gauge method. After placing a small piece of plastic gauge onto each main journal, fit the lower case and torque it in proper sequence to spec. Remove the case and check the width against the scale on the plastic gauge package. Make sure the crankshaft doesn't move or rotate during this operation. Any movement of the crank when the cases are torqued together will destroy the plastic gauge. The proper plastic gauge for this application comes in a green package and it's also used to size the balancer shaft bearings. Here you use the journal numbers on the shaft and these case numbers. Each time you check oil clearance the used plastic gauge must be removed. A shop cloth with a little bit of lacquer thinner or contact cleaner works well. Since the pistons and rods must be installed together as an assembly, the best time to fit new rod bearings is now before any other components are refitted to the block. The rod bearings are selected again using the standard Yamaha method. The rod journal number on the crankshaft is subtracted from the rod number itself and the appropriate bearing chosen. Again, you must verify oil clearance using plastic gauge and avoid having the rod or crank move during the assembly and disassembly process. Two very important points in regard to proper rod installation. First, as we mentioned during disassembly, the Y mark on the rod body and the dot on the rod cap must always face away from the adjacent rod. This is critical because these bearings are actually offset in the rod. Secondly, torquing the rod cap nuts must be done in two stages. After applying molly slip grease to the threads, install the cap and torque the nuts evenly to about 2.5 meter kilograms or about 18 foot pounds in one continuous motion. If torque pressure is interrupted between 3 and 3.8 meter kilograms, loosen the nuts and start again. This is critical. Remember, from 3 to 3.8 kilograms, pressure must be applied without interruption. Now, assuming you've done a thorough inspection of each engine component, you've got all the plane bearing size correctly, and the cases have been thoroughly cleaned, you can start reassembly.